So, all right, so today's, uh, today's lecture is gonna be on sort of examining the difference between vectorization and compilation. So the, the last two lectures, we, or last three lectures, we've been looking at different techniques to speed up query execution. And we've been looking at vectorization, and we looked at compilation. And, and, and as I showed, uh, you can get better performance right, if you do this. So the question is now, which one is better, or which one is, is the right approach, or what you should focus on in your, uh, when, if you're building a database system. Um, now, for the vectorization stuff, we talked about how, uh, the, from the Columbia paper, none of the techniques actually work as soon as you exceed your CPU cache. Right? Even though in the paper you guys read today, that's using AVX 512, the newer version of SIMD, that still holds true, right? That just because you have wider registers doesn't mean that SIMD now works if you exceed your CPU cache. So we'll see again, you know, to, to sort of understand this a little bit better today, and we'll also look at, see what it actually, what, what types of queries under what conditions will one approach be better. So this is more of like a micro benchmark paper that says, Here's two ways you can actually implement a database system, and let's compare them in, in a bunch of different ways, which I actually really like. So the two approaches they're going to look at are going to be vectorwise and hyper. So just as, as a refresher, in case of vectorwise, it, uh, it, was, it, was the, it was the commercial version of the MoneyDB X100 paper you guys read, and then later this was bought by Actian, and it's now called Actian Vector. So the way vectorwise is going to work is that they're not going to do compilation on the fly. They're instead going to have the database developers, the people actually building the database system itself, they're going to write a bunch of these primitives that do simple operations on, on data. Right? It'd be a sort of simple for loop and do one thing, like compare to see whether a value in a column is less than another value. So they're going to have a bunch of these that they're all now going to pre-compile, and that gets shipped in the database system binary. Then at runtime, what happens is that the database system figures out, well, here's what my query plan looks like, here's what the primitives I, I have, and sort of stitches together these pre-compiled primitives into a, you know, into the full, full query plan itself, right? And so, yes, you may be thinking, well, now you're making a bunch of function calls, isn't that going to be expensive? But because, you know, it's called vector-wise because they're going to operate on vectors of tuples, and so the function calls will be amortized because you're doing it over a batch of tuples. If you're doing it on a per-tuple basis, this approach would be terrible, and they avoid that by, you know, uh, by doing this in, in, in vector batches. The other alternative is the, the hyper approach using just-in-time compilation, which again, we, we talked about before. And the idea here is that you, uh, for the, when the query shows up, you're going to generate the code you then compile uh, for that, that single query. So you're gonna generate machine code or instructions that are hard coded just for that single query plan. And so that way you don't have any conditionals, you don't have any, you have very little branches because you're baking in the actual you know, machine code itself, the steps you need to do for the single query. But more than just doing compilation, uh, Hyper also does a sort of bottom to top or push based query processing model as opposed to the, the vectorized model from, from, uh, from vectorwise. So that means that starting from the bottom, your scan operators, they're going to emit a single tuple, and you're going to push that up into uh, different steps in the pipeline. And you keep going as far as you can up in the pipeline uh, until you hit a pipeline breaker, meaning you have to go back and get the next tuple before you can go on to the next pipeline. So you keep trying to, you try to ride that tuple all the way up, keeping things in CPU registers, and that way you have, you have fewer cache misses. So the question we're trying to, trying to figure out here is which of these two approaches is actually going to be better? Um, now, the, the, actually, the last, also I say it too, is the, the, the hyper one, as written in the, the paper you guys read and from the original hyper compilation paper, they don't vectorize any, any operations. So this is sort of like a scalar operations on a single tuple. We'll see how to actually fix this uh, at, the, at the end, what we've done here at Carnegie Mellon. So I, the title of this is not exactly correct. It's not really vectorization versus compilation because in all our examples here, we're going to actually we're going to be doing compilation for everything. So, I mean, in some ways, the the, the primitives and vectorwise are pre-compiled, right? And then we'll compile the query plans for in the in the hyper approach. So it's it's this higher level thing about is it better to sort of stitch together these smaller primitives and do batch processing on vectors, or is it better to do the sort of holistic compilation for the tau query plan and do the push-based processing model? That's the really way to understand this. And the, 
And then so, so, so these would be sort of be these strict dichotomy between these two different approaches. And that will show in our relaxed operator fusion paper, the, the work we've done here at Carnegie Mellon, this is where we actually get the best of both worlds. We're going to do the vectorized processing the same way that vectorized does, but we're also going to do the sort of push-based processing or compilation the way that hyper does, right? Sort of a hybrid approach. And they, they briefly mentioned about this in the paper. Of course, they say that it's hard to do, and so that's why they didn't evaluate it. Um, Remains to be seen whether that's actually true or not, whether how, how difficult it actually is. You know, it works for us, but it worked for a single paper. As we go out, go off and build a bigger system, we'll see what actually happens. All right, so in this paper, uh, they're going to implement a single test bed system. So rather than taking vector-wise or MoniB X100 and Hyper and try to do a, you know, a comparison to see these two different systems, uh, they're going to build a single test bed system that uses approaches to both of them. Right, and it's obviously the reason why you want to do this because there's a bunch of other crap the data system does, as we've been talking about this entire semester, that's going to prevent you from having a true apples to apples comparison. Right, the way you know the, the, that that vector wise parses a SQL may be different than how Hyper does it, or Hyper uses an art index and vector wise might use something else. Right, like these are different things that we don't care about in this evaluation, so therefore we don't want to use the full system. So we'll go and use uh, a test bed system that we write from scratch. Uh, as, as our test bed. So at a high level, all the algorithms in these two different implementations will be the same. You know, they're going to do the same kind of hash join, you know, linear probing, uh, you know, or the, you know, the same kind of uh, scan operators. The difference is going to be in the actual low level implementation will be slightly different. Right? Again, the paper discusses some of these for some aspects of it. The most obvious example was what hash function to use when you're doing, uh, uh, you know, building your hash table and doing the probe. In the case of vector-wise, they're going to use Murmur2 uh, because although that uses more instructions than CRC, it actually has a higher throughput um, and which you actually get better performance in vector-wise because they separate the hashing versus the probing phases, right? Whereas in, uh, in hyper, it's all sort of all put together into a single pipeline, right? In the case of hyper, they're going to use CRC um, and this is because when they use this over number two, they get 40% better performance. And this is because they are, CRC is using fewer instructions than number two. And therefore, the CPU is actually be able to get better speculative execution. So again, the high level of the algorithms are the same. They're both, you can do hash join. They're both doing linear probing. But how the actual steps or the, the low level things or uh, the low level steps in those algorithms will be slightly different. They're tuned exactly or they pick the best approach for the two different architectures. So the two different implementations they're going to have in their test bed are colorfully named as Tectorwise and Typer. Quick, quick guess. Anyone take guess why it's called Tectorwise and Typer? I'm just actually curious if anybody knows. What's that? He says test. No. He says no. <laughs> First of all, his name is Timo. T I M O. It's just after his name. That's all it is, all right? Not Tess, not, not my dog. All right, all right. So, and it, this was very impressive, right? Um, so, right, so Tectorwise is going to be based on Vectorwise. Uh, and again, we're going to break up the operations in our query plan into these precompiled primitive steps. And the, the key important thing you need to understand about how Vectorwise works, or Tectorwise, um, is going to work is that these primitives have to materialize the result of the function invocation every time you invoke the function, right? Like I'm, I'm passing in a vector to the function, I'm going to crunch on it, and I'm going to write it out to an output vector that then has to be written to someplace in memory, and then I pass that back as the fu function return value. So that now needs to be materialized in memory, and then that, that needs to be passed on to the next, the next primitive that I invoke, right? So there's a quite a bit of mem copy being done here, right, between these different primitives. In the case of Hyper, because as I said, they're doing this push-based approach where, these, these, where they try to maximize the pipeline length, meaning the same tuple is going to hit every single step as far as you can up in the pipeline. And so under this approach, you can keep the same tuple or the values, the, inter the intermediate results that you're generating for each step in the pipeline in your CPU registers, and therefore that's going to be super fast. And therefore you're, you're not going to have as many cache misses as you possibly have in, in the vectorized case. Right? 
So again, the, the, the difference here is that, again, vector-wise can process vectors at a time. So therefore, you can use SIMD and other vectorization, uh, SIMD vectorization for this. In Hyper, you can't do it as, way as, as described here because, again, it's a single tuple at a time. So in their evaluation, they're going to look at uh, five different queries from TPCH. And these are sort of hand-selected to be representative of, you know, of the different types of uh, work you need to do in your database system for, uh, for do analytical queries. So the original TPCH benchmark has 22 queries. Again, they're just selecting five here. So this is a great paper actually written also by the Germans, Peter Bontz and, and, um, and Thomas Neumann from Hyper and Vectorwise where they do an analysis of TPCH and they look at every single query and they discuss what are actually going on in the query plans, what are the pain points inside of an in-memory database system. So if you want to see sort of why they pick these as being representative of what real-world look, look, workloads look like, it comes from th this paper they published in 2013. So we're doing Q1, Q6, Q3, 9, and 18. So Q1 is doing fixed point arithmetic and then it's a group by but it only has four groups. Uh, Q6 is just doing uh, predicate evaluation, so, so you know, it has filters to, to prune out tuples you don't need. 3 and 9 are doing joins, but 9 is joining a much larger, uh, has a less, much larger build side than, than, than the, the probe side. And then 18 is doing a high cardinality aggregation, so it's a group I with 1.5 million groups, which is, is pretty massive, so it's a big hash table. All right, so again, these are, we can use these to figure out what our what are the different workload scenarios or types of queries that one approach might be better than another? So the first experiment we're going to look at is the single-threaded performance. So this is running on a 10-core uh, machine uh, with hyper-threading, so 20, 20 threads in total. But for this one, they're just going to run it on a single thread. And they're just going to see what the runtime difference is between different systems. So the first thing to point out is that for Q1 and Q18, uh, vec uh, Hyper actually performed better. But for the 6, 3, and 9, vector-wise actually performs better. So again, these are the two joins, and then this one was the, uh, was the aggregation, right? Go back. No, the, sorry, selective filters. I, this was the selective filters and the two joins. So for the aggregation queries, 1 and 18 do better. So what, is it, what, do, these, what do these graphs tell us? Can we infer anything from this? It depends, right? No, because these are just sort of, here's the runtime. Poof, it's done, right? So what you actually have to do is actually look at the performance counters. So for this one, we're gonna, they're going to measure cycles, uh, inst instructions per cycle, instructions total, L1, last level cache misses, and then branch misses. And then the little star here just says to remind you of which one ran, ran the fastest here. All right? So again, these are a lot of numbers. Can we infer anything from this? Well, uh, the first thing is that, I would say also too, these numbers are, are normalized based on the number of tuples processed per query, right? So to read this is like per query they had, this one took 56 cycles, right? Sorry, per tuple, this took 56 cycles. And they're doing scale factor one, which is, is a one gigabyte database. So the first thing we can look at is the two cases where uh, Hyper actually performed better. And the most obvious thing here is that the, the number of instructions that Hyper executes versus Vectorwise is, 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 is half, or almost, yeah, in this case here, more than, more than half, right? So this is an example of clearly executing fewer instructions per tuple will get you better performance, right? And so for these queries here, uh, these are more computation expensive, right? Q1 is doing fixed point arithmetic, um, and it's doing inline in-cache aggregation because it's, it's only four elements. Right, so just really how fast can you, can you, or how many instructions do you have to execute per tuple is, is, the, is the, the thing that's going to matter the most. Right? And that's why, in this case here, right, it's, it's executing fewer instructions, and therefore it, it does better. But now, can, can we apply the same kind of metric to other queries? Well, right, yeah, so, sorry. The, right, the point I'm trying to make here is that, again, you execute fewer instructions, you do better. You may think actually getting uh, more instructions per cycle would be another metric you can use to determine whether you're doing better. But in this case here, right, this is executing 1.6 instructions per cycle per tuple, and this is 2.1. So this is technically doing more work per cycle on the CPU, right? But it's actually doing worse because it's just executing way more instructions. And the reason why VectorWise can get better instructions per cycle is because 
it just has those tight loops, right? Those tight kernels that are just doing one operation on a vector tuples at a time. Whereas, vector, uh, whereas hyper is actually, you know, has these more complex loops because it's pipelining something all the way up, up the plan. So in this case here, the, in Q1, the, the uh, instructions per cycle is 40% better than in vector-wise than over hyper, but it does 74% worse, or 75% worse, right? Because it's just doing more work per tuple. Right, so now the question is, can we apply that same con that same evaluation uh, uh, criteria to the other queries and see whether that still holds? Right. So if we look at this one here, Q3, right, which is the join on the 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 larger the larger probe side than the build side, hyper executes fewer instructions, 21 versus 42, and again the uh, the instructions per cycle is different, right? This is getting much better uh, CPU utilization, but vector-wise actually performs better here. So again, up in Q1, or, Q, or Q, uh, the last one here too as well, hyper-executed fewer instructions, uh, but vector-wise got more instructions per cycle, but hyper actually still was better. For this one here, we're still executing fewer instructions. Uh, this is still getting better instructions per cycle, but vector-wise is doing better, right? And we take guess why. Branch misses, right? Look at how much different uh, you know, the difference here, right? This is, has 0 0.8, 0 0.08. This is 0.27, right? Because again, the 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 scans or, or the extra primitives themselves don't have any if clauses. There's no conditional, so it's just ripping through as fast as possible. And again, the loops are really tight. Whereas in uh, in hyper these longer pipelines mean that if the branch prediction gets wrong, right, it has to, it's more expensive to roll back a bunch of crap that you did that you're not actually going to need and then go back and, and you know, go down the, down the right path. And because there's less, uh, you know, there's more indirection or more conditionals in the hypercode itself that they're generating, that's why they have higher branch misses. All right, all right, so maybe say, all right, now is it branch misses that matters the most? Well, if we look at this one here, Hyper has fewer branch misses. Uh, hyper executes fewer instructions, and still hyper uh, hyper has worse instructions per cycle. Um, so now the question is: Is it this one that actually matters? And right, again, this is just another join, the same way that uh, Q3 is. It's just the, the 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 build side is now is now larger. So in this case here, right, it's not any of these. It's actually just the cycles, right? So in this, in this query here, the hash table is larger, right, because there's, there's more tuples on the build side. So that means that there's the likelihood that the thing we're looking for, the entry in our hash table, is not in our TPU cache. So therefore, we have memory stalls. And therefore, that increases the, the number of cycles we're executing per query, right? In the case of, again, of, of vector-wise, these simple loops that are doing the probes, it's doing them on vectors, right? It's not, it's, it's just taking the tuple, not playing any predicates, just doing the hash and then checking to see whether the hash matches from the vector hashes. So in that case here, the CPU can speculate it farther ahead, sort of unroll the loop and say, here's a bunch of stuff I think is going to happen. And then it can go ahead and prefetch that, that memory if, if possible. As you take it back, you can't prefetch, you still speculate. You speculate execute the instructions, which bring in the things you're going to need, and that mass, mass your cache stalls or, or memory stalls. So again, the main takeaway from all these results is just showing you that there's not one approach is better than another, right? We have a bunch of different queries that do different things in TPCH, and in some cases the hyper approach is better, in some cases the vector-wise approach is better. And then under the cases where one is better than another, it's not any one single CPU performance counter we can point out and say this is actually what, what is why we're running slower, or why another one is running faster. It depends. So that's very dissatisfying, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is, right? So the main findings are that the, both of the models generate efficient uh, query execution and get roughly the same performance. Right, just to be clear also too, when we go back to the, the runtime here, right? yes, it looks like HyperZoom much better, but we're talking, this is what, 50, about 50 milliseconds, and this is like 85 milliseconds. So a 30 millisecond difference on a one gigabyte database is like nothing. And as the paper pointed out, these are still two order, I mean, both of these systems are still two orders of magnitude faster than like what Postgres and a disk-based system can do. 
So we're really shaving off like, you know, cycles and milliseconds here. Um, and at some point you get diminishing returns. We actually, you know, with uh, Prashant, before we, he did, or after he did the ROF paper we'll talk about next, he spent about a half a year trying to like make hash joins work even faster. And it got down to the point where like, ah, oh, this, this is 12 cycles and now we got ours to be 11 cycles. Like it's, it's got to the point where like it's, it's so fast, like it doesn't matter. Right? So I would say that in both these cases, there's no glaring difference between these two different systems. Right? They're still going to crush every, you know, all the disk-based disk or traditional database systems. And then under, under some queries, one will be better than, than another. Right. Uh, the other main takeaway also, too, is that the hyper approach, you know, the data-centric push, push model, is better for computational queries with fewer cache misses because you can ride along and do, you can execute uh, the, the pipeline of instructions for that single tuple for as much as possible. But as soon as you have cache misses, uh, then, then the vectorized approach is better. Okay? All right, so the next question is, uh, how much does SIMD uh, vectorization help the vectorized approach to get better performance? And so in all the, the results I just showed you, that was with SIMD enabled in, in vector-wise. So the question is now, what, how much does SIMD actually contribute to the performance benefit you get in the vector-wise approach? And so for this, uh, we should have spent more time covering this maybe last class, but they're using AVX 512, which came out in 2017, because this now, which came after the Columbia paper you guys read, but this now has uh, a bunch of new instructions to make it easier to implement the algorithms that we, that we talked about. And everything's going to be uh, vertical vectorization. We're not going to do any of the horizontal vectorization. So the first experiment they're going to do, uh, this is running on, on a single thread. They're going to take the primitives in vectorwise and for, to, you know, to, to execute a query. And I think this was Q3. Um, no, it's Q3 and, and Q9. And they're going to implement it in a scalar version and a SIMD version. And they're going to measure for just executing that one primitive what the performance benefit you actually get. Right? And this is when every, again, everything fit, fits into your CPU cache. And this basically follows up or, or matches, or corroborates the results we saw from the Columbia paper. Right? For hashing, you get a 2.3x speed up. The, the SIMD with, with the gather gets 1.1, and then the SIMD join gets you 1.4. So this is showing, again, for the individual operations, if you, sim, you vectorize them with SIMD, you get better performance, right? so, sort of as expected. The problem now is then if you put it into the full query, you see you don't get that big of a speed up. So Q3 and Q9, again, are the joins. Um, and for this case here, the, the performance benefit you get is it's marginal at best. All right? Again, which is, which corroborates what we said before. Once, it, once you exceed your CPU cache, it's the memory stalls that kill you, and vectorization doesn't help. The next question we had about this paper was uh, how, what does it actually take to actually vectorize this, the code, the primitives in vectorwise? Right? In the original vectorized paper, they talked about, oh, yeah, you, if you have a compiler, they can sort of figure out how to vectorize your primitives automatically for you. But then remember I said last class, there's essentially three ways to get vectorization. You can, you know, you, you can pray and hope your compiler does it for you. You can provide hints, or you can do explicit vectorization. So we wanted to figure out uh, how good the compiler actually could be. So for this, we compared against the th sort of three major compilers, so GCC, Clang, and ICC is Intel's, I think it's free, I, I always forget. Uh, it's, it's their sort of their, their, their custom compiler that, that they build and, and sell. Um, so for all of these, we found that the Intel compiler worked way better than everyone else. Um, so for this one, we're, we're just doing auto vectorization. We're not doing any hints, right? We're just seeing how well the compiler can identify that these little primitives in vectorwise can be vectorized. Um, and the ICC put everything into 512, which I think, think was interesting. So it was able to vectorize the hashing, selecting, selection, and projection primitives, but it wasn't able to vectorize the hash table probing and aggregation. And this is it's expected, right? Because this is like, uh, you know, these are random memory lookups that can't easily be put into, you know, SIMD instructions, right? Same, you know, the, both of these are dealing with hash tables. So for this, now we're actually going to see how well the system performs only using ICC, we, we can ignore GCC and Clang, how well it actually performs versus uh, when we manually uh, add the intrinsics to vectorize our, our primitives versus sort of doing a hybrid approach that uses a combination of 
manly written code or handwritten code and, and the auto vectorization. So for this one, uh, we're first going to measure what, what is the reduction in instructions that the two, uh, the, 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 or the, the three approaches generate. So again, the, the first one is the auto vectorization, ICC. Then we have our handwritten ones, and then we have the, the auto and manual. So Q6, again, was the selective scans. The, it actually made it worse. It made the, instruction, the number of instructions larger. Um, but it's, I think it's kind of interesting that, that the, well, the hybrid two approaches of these two actually match exactly. And this is sort of expected because it's just doing selective scans. It's not doing anything fancy. Um, so this shows you that the, 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 the auto vectorization does reasonably OK, right? Like for not having to do any extra work and to get you know, almost as good of, of what you can get manually, and if not better in some cases, is not bad. But again, this is just measuring the number of instructions. Uh, it's not measuring what the actual performance is. So when we actually measure performance, now we see the, 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 the difference is marginal at best, in some, some cases worse, right? So for this one, this is running, uh, I think this is, TPC, this is TPCH running with a scale factor 10. Um, and again, we're just comparing what the runtime is. So it's the, 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 the difference of the runtime versus the, the non-vectorized version. So again, it, it's hit or miss. The auto vectorization actually does worse for the, join, the two joins and the, the, the final aggregation, whereas the handwritten ones actually do uh, slightly better. But again, this matches up with what we saw before, where you only get a 1.x speed up in, in performance, or a reduction in time. So the main takeaway here is that you probably don't want to do auto vectorization if you're doing a vectorized approach, because it's just, right, the, the performance actually is going gonna, is gonna to get worse. Um, and then the cache misses are just, again, st still going to overwhelm the, any benefit you can actually get. Right, any questions about the, uh, the, you know, this work here? The, the tectorwise versus, versus typer. OK. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, this comment in the paper when they talked about how the, you know, the vectorization and the compilation from vectorwise versus hyper they're essentially mutually exclusive. They talk about how you could have a hybrid approach, but the software engineering overhead for actually supporting that is, is actually is, was quite, di quite difficult. So in order to understand how we can combine these two, we need to understand what Hyper is actually doing when it fuses its operators together right? to have these long pipelines. And again, the big idea that Hyper does is that they're going to fuse by combining these operators together and having this sort of giant for loop where you're doing all the, all the operations for a single tuple until you hit your pipeline breaker, this is going to maximize your CPU, CPU register reuse because you don't put anything out into your cache because you just take the same tuple and keep going up, up in it. And this is also going to allow you to minimize cache misses because it's not, you're not going to do one small thing on a tuple, then go back and get the next tuple and do the same operation over and again the way that Vectorwise does. You take the same tuple and then, and then process it all the way up. So they have this nice chart here uh, where they talk about the, so the trade-off between the, the vectorization and the compilation. And along the x-axis, you have interpretation versus compilation. Right? You have interpretation is again you have something that has to figure out on the fly what it needs to do for a particular query, whereas in compilation is everything's baked in. And then tuple time versus vectorization. So the two extremes, again, compilation would be hyper over here, vectorwise over there. And so I want to talk about us over here. I don't know why we're like not here, but whatever. Um, <laughs> I'm okay with that. All right. So let's understand a little bit more now what let's get, let's go in more detail what Hyper is actually doing. So again, the idea is that you have this pipeline of these operators on some sort of slice of your query plan tree, and you're going to fuse them together and compile that as a single loop, right? And under the Hyper approach, again, they're doing this on a, on a single tuple at a time. So say your query plan looks like this. Say this is your pipeline. Under, under, uh, under Hyper, your, your, basically the code you would generate was, would be like this. Right? You have the first sort of pipeline. Where you're iterating every, every single tuple in A. Then you apply your filter, and, you, and you, then you store it into your aggregation, your hash table, because you, you, you're putting an aggregate. And then in the second pipeline, then you iterate over every single tuple in your aggregation after you've computed it and sh shove it up as, as the output of your pipeline. Right? So the, 
the issue again is going to be we 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 showed how you can get some benefit from vectorization, um, but the issue is going to be that there's uh, the cache misses overwhelm you. So the idea is that is there a way we can sort of rethink how we want to organize this these pipelines in such a way that we can mask those cache misses and then still be able to do vector and, and be able to do vectorized execution. So the thing we need to do in order to do this, we understand where are the problems, right? With this sort of tuple at a time approach, All right? So again, so these are our three uh, three steps or three parts or operations in our pipeline: scan, filter, aggregation. So the first issue is going to be this uh, this filter here, right? Because we're operating on a single tuple at a time to do this comparison inside this for loop, we can't vectorize this, right? You can't use SIMD, right? Because it's one tuple, do the evaluation, then go back and get the next one, right? And then the next issue is this aggregation here. We're not going to be able to prefetch anything because we have to do a hash table lookup because we're operating on the single tuple here, right? So the idea is that the issue is that the, the, the tuple at a time processing model does not expose any sort of inner tuple parallelism. We can't do a bunch of stuff on a bunch, a bunch of steps on a bunch of tuples at the same time and do that in parallel in SIMD, right? As it's written, again, this is a for loop that's doing, uh, that's scalar, doing a single tuple operation at a time. So the, the technique that my student Prashant came up with is called relaxed operator fusion. And the idea here is that you identify where are steps in the, in the pipeline for that code I just showed, where we can introduce sort of buffering stages and allow us to store things in vectors and then prefetch those vectors as, as needed uh, as we iterate over the loop. Again, the idea is we want to get the best of both worlds. We want to get vectorization and we want to get the, the, the compilation benefits that, that, that Hyper has, right? So in each stage, we're, we're going to still have multiple operators, right? Again, we're taking a single pipeline, break it up, it's going to have multiple operators. So it's not like we're going back to the volcano approach, the iterator model, where we have one tuple or one vector per, you know, per, per operation. We can do a bunch of stuff. And then just like in Hyper, you know, instead of passing data, you know, we're not going to be able to pass data through, through registers, but now we'll be able to at least pass them in our caches, and that'll be, uh, that'll be just as fast. So going back to our example here, right? These are our uh, two pipelines, right? We identify that this is what we actually want to vectorize, the filter candidate. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce this new staging buffer for our pipeline, right? So actually, this, this should be moved up here. So the pipeline should be, the first pipeline is aggregation filter scan. So the pipeline is still this, but now we're going to introduce a stage between the, between the, the, the scan and filter and the aggregation. Again, this sits in our CPU caches. We can write a bunch of tuples at a time into this, and then when it fills up, we go to the next one, you know, move it up to the next, the next, the next uh, stage. So now if we go back to our query plan, uh, I'm sort of showing some pseudocode here, but here we're now in our, in our for loop, we're iterating over the, 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 the table A in steps of 1024. So we're grabbing 1024 tuples at a time in a vector, then we can do our SIMD comparison, right? Because we, we have everything, we just shove it into the register and then, and then crunch on it. And then we take the, the, the selection max that comes out of this from, from our, our vector, and then we can then update our, our hash table here, right? So in this case here, the first stage is, is grabbing the tuples and doing the comparison. Then we write all the output of this into our stage buffer, and then in the second stage, we, we, we do our aggregation. And then the, the top is still the same. So, all right, so this is awesome. This allows us to do vectorization, but this doesn't solve the problem we had before, where if we have cache stalls or cache misses, then uh, we're going to get bad performance, or SIMD is going to help us. All right, so it's really this part here, the for loop, as, as, or the, 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 the getting the vector from, from the table. That's where we're, we can introduce cache misses and cause problems. I mean, th th this as well, but. This is the main thing we want to deal with here. So what we're going to introduce is uh, explicit software prefetching in now our, our stages that to instruct the CPU as we make a pass on one, on one for loop, we tell it, hey, we're going to come back around and execute this for loop again. Go prefetch 
the, the next data we're, we're, gonna get, we're gonna need and put it in into our CPU caches. And this avoids having the cache miss when you come back around in, in our for loop. Again, Hyper doesn't have this problem because it's, it's a single tuple and you do a bunch of stuff on it before you go back and get the next one. So you're not paying that, uh, you know, the, the, the I mean, you can still potentially have cache misses, but for each tuple you bring in, you're doing a bunch of work. Whereas in this case here, because now I have two for loops, I can have cache misses here and cache misses there, and cache misses here as well, and the, the last one here. So the idea is that we're gonna do solve our prefetching to tell the CPU, hey, we know, we know what we're gonna need, please go get it for us. So uh, I'm not gonna go details of how solve our prefetching works. Uh, I will say that this is, you know, this is not new to us. Like this is not, we're not the first database system to actually explore this. Um, there was a bunch of work done in 2006, 2005 in this area. Actually, somebody messaged me on Twitter from Postgres. They were thinking about adding this in Postgres now as well. Um, wh the reason why this works now, and, and it didn't quite work before, is that the number of outstanding prefetch requests you can have in your CPU has increased. Right? Intel and Xeons have, have increased uh, the number of memory locations you can have prefetched. It used to be much, much smaller. So for, to do this vectorization, it wouldn't work because the, the, the number of memory locations you need to prefetch in, in to the CPU was not enough when you, when you come back around and you still had stalls. So to real quick, just look at evaluation of this. So this is the actually the same graph I showed before um, when we talked about compilation in Peloton. We're showing that the you know the interpreted version versus the the LLVM uh, version. But now I'm also including LLVM plus the relax, uh, relaxed operator fusion. So the first point here in this particular query in Q1. Right, this doesn't help you because this is very computation expensive. So the ca we're not we're not having a lot of cache misses. So all the prefetching and the operative fusion stuff doesn't help us. You see a bigger difference over here, this one here, and actually for all of these, right? Because this is where you're doing um, you're doing again long, longer scans, more complex ag aggregations, and this is where the the prefetching does help, right? So to now do a breakdown and say, well, what actually is the benefit we're getting from the relaxed operator fusion versus the compilation versus the prefetching? Uh, we, we have a breakdown chart here. So this is Q19. And again, so this is, in, this is the old Peloton system. So this is what we used to do before. This is the interpreter engine, right? This is why we, we threw away all the code and wanted to build out an LLVM engine, right? It's just, it's just crap, so it's not, not even worth discussing. Um, in the compiled version, going from this and this, you get a 97% you know, speed up. Again, in a, in a, in a, in a well-written interpreted database system, it would not be 97%. It'll be something smaller, but because this was crap, this was so much better, that's why it's so high. But now you see, again, if you add now ROF with SIMD, you get a 65% speed up. And then for getting prefetching, you get a 3.5% speed up. So again, this is sort of what I was saying before. We're sort of cutting down cycles and trying to get this thing run as fast as possible. And like, we're down to 189 milliseconds. It's, there's not much, much more room we can slice off, okay? So again, this, the main thing I wanted to show here is that you can do SIMD and compilation together. Uh, the paper you guys read, they just, didn't, they just didn't do that comparison. It is what it is. Okay, so uh, to finish up, the, the vector-wise versus hyper is one approach better than another. The answer is no, it's inconclusive, right? Uh, there's a bunch of other things that I don't think are really relevant to our discussion in this class, but like looking at different CPU architectures and seeing whether there's, there's a difference. I think all that's very interesting, but at a, at a high level, you know, most data systems are gonna run on Intel Xeons, so you, you know, that's, that, you know, it makes sense to target the, those architectures. And then again, the ROF stuff that we came up with allows us to actually uh, to do both. And again, the, the, the main idea of what we're ending doing, those stages we have to generate, those are more instructions. There's more work we have to do to prepare the data, put it into the stages, keep track of the stages, read them back in as we go, come back around, right? But in exchange for getting better instructions, we get better instructions per cycle. I don't know what CPI, it's IPC, okay? All right, so next class, we're gonna talk about query optimization. And it's the hardest part of, 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 it's probably the hardest topic we're gonna to discuss all, all semester. And so there's, there's this great quote in the Davis community that says, query optimization is, is not rocket science. If you flunk out of query optimization, then you can go build rockets, right? This is the hardest part of actually in a database system to actually get right. And the paper you guys are gonna read 
for Wednesday will be a description of the Cascades architecture, the Cascades model um, that that our our query optimizer is based on. And then, which in my opinion is better, the Germans disagree. Then you'll read next Monday's paper will be from the Germans saying that the the, the paper this the paper you're reading next Monday will refute the paper you're reading this Wednesday and say why it's bad and why the German way is better, right? Uh, but it's hard, right? So so I'll try to go through as you know sort of as I'll try to guide you into the process as easy as possible. The then after 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 you understand the different ways to implement an optimizer, then we'll discuss how you should actually do query cost estimation, which is another hard part of this. You know that 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 all the models we'll talk about don't even work unless you have a cost model. So the next three weeks, again, it sucks that it's the end of the semester, but like at this point where we are in our system, I kind of had to put it here because we don't have a query optimizer in the, the new system yet. But I, in my opinion, this is the most, one of the most interesting parts. And as, as I said before, if you can do query optimization well. Uh, then you can get a job anywhere, right? You can get a job tomorrow, okay? Because every because everyone has credit optimization problems, okay? Any questions? Stacks and six packs on the table, and I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, so down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Isles.